I call this meeting of Conroe Independent School District Board of Trustees to order. Let the record show that a quorum of members is present, that this meeting has been duly called, that the notice of this meeting has been posted in accordance with Texas Open Meetings Act, Texas Government Code, Chapter 551. The time is 6.01. All right, item one, invocation and pledge of allegiance, if you will. Trustee Kidd, please. If you feel so inclined, uh, please bow your heads and pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for loving us. Thank you for your grace. Dear Father, we just, uh, this time of year, this time of season, we just uh, help us to reflect on everything that you've given us, all the blessings that you've bestowed on this district and on our children and on our families and on our teachers and our uh, staff. Lord, we just pray for their protection over these holidays. Uh, we, we pray, Lord, that those that are in need, uh, that others reach out and, and meet those needs and just pray just for your uh, oversight and your love throughout this time. Dear God, thank you for uh, those in this room and their, and their hearts for serving your children, your students, Lord. And we just ask for your guidance and your direction uh, for tonight's meeting. Uh, we just uh, pray that you be here and just uh, bless this time together and as we make uh, decisions on behalf of the district. Uh, Lord, thank you again for loving us. In your holy name we pray. Amen. 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 I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Honor the Texas flag, our pledge allegiance to be Texas, one state under God, one indivisible. Thank you, Mr. Kidd. <coughs> Item two, citizen participation. Ms. Godfrey, has anyone signed up to address the board? Yes, 10 citizens have signed up to speak. Okay. This is pretty long, so. The next item on the agenda is public comment from those who've registered to address the board in accordance with board policy BED. Everyone is reminded that this portion of the meeting is not appropriate form for bringing complaints for which resolution is sought. Before complaints can be submitted to the board of trustees as an agenda item, they must be addressed by the following, by following the appropriate policies and administrative procedures. Also, please keep in mind that the board has no obligation to protect the, the board has an obligation to protect the confidentiality of information that could possibly, uh, could personally identify a student. The board cannot permit comments that include student's name or any information that might identify a specific student. This prohibition does not apply if the person speaking is the student's parent or guardian or, guardian, or is the, over the, the, the student is over the age of 18 and speaking about him or herself. If an issue is mentioned that is not, if an issue is mentioned that is on the tonight's agenda, posted agenda, the board would defer its decision of the issue until the item is reached on the agenda. For any subject that is not on the board's posted agenda, the board cannot deliberate or make a decision, but it can furnish specific factual information or cite existing policy in response to inquiries. Due to the number of citizens that is registered to address the board, each person is limited to no more than three minutes for their presentation. This will allow the board to hear from, hear from citizens as well as ensure the board meeting runs efficiently, as there are many important items on the board agenda that must be considered. Everyone in attendance is reminded to treat all speakers with respect, regardless of whether they agree or disagree with the speaker's message. Any person who does not conduct himself or herself accordingly will be asked to leave or will be escorted from the room. Ms. Godfrey, please call the first person. Lucy Thomas. <clears throat> Firstly, I want to make you all aware that what I have to say here is not an attack on anyone. I do not believe that what a person says defines them. I do not doubt that many people on this board are good people, but 
good people sometimes make bad choices. I would love to stand here today and talk about love, but what I need to talk about is the US Constitution. Mr. Inman has made it clear on social media that a man wearing heels or makeup or being homosexual is against his personal religious beliefs, calling it ungodliness. He has also stated, we need God back in our schools. What, whilst Mr. Inman is entitled to his personal freedom of speech and religion, he also has a constitutional duty to separate himself from his religious views when he serves on this school board. The US Department of Education clearly states the First Amendment establishes certain limits on the conduct of public school officials as it relates to religious activity. When school officials make public statements, they must ensure at all times that they are clear as to who and what they are representing. Mr. Inman failed to do this whilst identifying himself as a Conroe ISD trustee to the media. If someone takes issue with a school activity, they have the right to remove their child from it on religious grounds, but under no circumstances do they have the right to remove anyone else's child or force a school to impose their religious views. A religion banning men wearing heels is no different to another banning females showing their hair. We must respect their religious views by allowing them to remove themselves from situations where women have uncovered hair or permit them to cover their own hair. We do not impose the covering of female hair. We allow freedom of religious expression without persecution of others. Mr. Inman could have made a choice to privately discuss his religious <coughs> beliefs with the principal of Willis ISD. He could have privately arranged for the removal of his child during activities where men may be wearing heels or gay people are present, as is his right. Instead, Mr. Inman made a choice to use his prominent position in our community, identifying himself as a Conroe ISD trustee, to try and impose his religious beliefs on an entire school. We do not need any God in our schools, Mr. Inman. We need the protections we are constitutionally entitled to. We need to promote acceptance, acceptance in this magnificently diverse world. Our schools should be celebrating difference and setting a positive example, showing how people of different religions with different lifestyles, cultures and worldviews can live in harmony alongside each other. I fully respect Mr. Inman's right to remove his child from certain activities. I do not expect a public school board member to call for a principal of another school district to lose their job because they do not share the same religious beliefs. How can teachers of Conroe ISD be sure that Mr. Inman will not use his position of power to remove them if their religious beliefs differ? How can students that follow any belief system or none feel safe and supported at school when a school trustee is promoting his religious belief and God above others? Our children are protected by the First Amendment. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Emily Harris. Hey there, my name is Emily Harris. My husband and I are raising three children here um, in the Conroe ISD School District. I am very concerned with board member Dale Inman's views toward the LGBTQ community. He said, and I quote, the LGBT community is one of the most vile, hate-filled communities I've ever come across. And I've spent time in the Middle East with Hezbollah and radical Muslims. These folks are vicious. His words are unnecessarily harmful and strikingly bold. Mr. Inman certainly does not stand with the Conroe ISD, freedom from discrimination, harassment and retaliation policy. Mr. Inman has violated this policy not only regarding religion, calling Muslims radical, but also with regard to the gender-based harassment portion of this policy, which states as follows. Quote, gender-based harassment includes physical, verbal, or nonverbal conduct based on the student's gender, the student's expression or characteristics perceived as stereotypical for the student's gender or the student's failure to conform to stereotypical notions of masculinity or femininity. Examples of gender-based harassment directed against a student, regardless of the student's or the harasser's actual or perceived sexual orientation or gender identity may include offensive jokes, name calling, slurs, or rumors. I would like to remind Mr. Inman that there are without a doubt LGBTQ teens within the sound of his voice in Conroy SD. And his public comments have harmful and dangerous implications for LGBTQ teens. On that note, I have attached this image for your review. 
I am disturbed by all of Mr. Inman's homophobic and xenophobic comments. But I want to turn your attention now toward Mr. Inman's alarming actions involving a student. Here you can see that Mr. Inman has publicly circulated a student's name on social media with whom he obviously disagrees. How wholly inappropriate to produce a student's name under these circumstances. Again, there are harmful and dangerous implications for his actions. As a CISD parent, I am appalled that a sitting board member found this appropriate. This should be concerning to us all. I see that CISD very recently cha changed their website landing page to read, all means all, well done. I love the sentiment, but I do not think Mr. Inman espouses it. Mr. Inman's anti-LGBT views, as well as his anti-Muslim views, absolutely cloud his judgment. How disappointing to have a board member who is not an advocate for all. Lastly, I'd like to make this board aware that at least two formal civil rights complaints have been filed with the Department of Education because of Mr. Inman, Inman's words and actions. Thank you, Ms. Harris. Thank you. Ginger Pilot. Tonight, I will get, again address the concerns I have as a parent and how different conversations are now being had with our youth, teachers, parents, and the general public <clears throat> due to hateful and harmful words from someone who is in a position that we should all look up to. As you all are aware, that person is Dale Inman. Every day, parents have to take steps to protect their children. Everything from wearing a seatbelt, looking away from their phone when they're walking, eating healthy, to helping them be confident in themselves. When you are a parent of a child that is also a part of the LGBT community, you have to also take action in preparing them to cope with potential negative reactions that are based on fear and misinformation. You have to hope that the school will not make your child feel less than the amazing person that they are. I am a part of several groups that exist because of fear, misinformation, and outright hate against a community. I am a part of these to help both adults and children and to let them know I'm here for them, that I love them, and I will help them in any way that I can. Dale Inman stated that the LGBT community didn't need protecting, but the conservative Christians did. It is sad to see that he thinks that there is a division in these communities. I am not a part of the Christian community. However, I will stand when you do to pray out of respect. I do accept that your religion is precious to you. I will not place judgment on you because we believe different things. I also will not lump an entire Christian community in a statement because a community is made up of so many different people that they should not be judged based on the actions of one or many. We are all one community and should love and support each other and know that there are differences in us. When someone in Dale Inman's position says that a community, says that the community these children are a part of is vile, what do you think this does? What impact do you think this has on a young mind? Negative words, negative words can have a long lasting, can have long lasting results that spread far beyond the person whom they were intended. Words are powerful. Their power arises from our emotional response to them. They can spark love, fear, sadness, happiness. As a member of the school board, your word should empower, be used to uplift, encourage, and to help build up a child, not tear them down. In the last month's meeting, people spoke of the great things that Dale Inman has done in his life. The reason we are coming to speak is not to erase those good deeds that you have done, but it is to help you understand that you did speak out into the, into the world some hateful words that warrant an apology. You owe our youth an apology. When we heard, we then heard that his words were not directed to any children. Again, you spoke these words out into the world. That means they're out there for all to hear. I know I'm out of time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. John Nix. <laughs> Last name? Nix. Nix. Thank you. Hi, 
Hi all, uh, this is, um, my name is John Nix. A couple of three things I want to talk about. First, I'd like to see po Wi-Fi policy change for this building to where we can access social websites like Facebook and such. Cell phone coverage stinks. I have Cricket, no coverage. Verizon, only one, I also have Verizon, only one bar. It's, it can't communicate with the outside world that we need to. So I'd like to see Wi-Fi policies changed on that. Item number two, I'd like to see uh, the, the, the delivery policies change for drive to, that students can have food delivery. I'm an app-based driver, they still do it. They'll say meet you outside or put under a bench or whatever, but then at the high school. So I'd like to see the policy change where they can feel safe, maybe have a table outside the high schools or something, like Tom Bollius does. Those are the two things I'd like to say. And on the third issue, I am like with everyone else, it's time for the for the trustee in question to step down. There are things that you can say that are hurtful. There's, we have freedom of speech, but there are times when it crosses the line. Like, I can't say I'm gonna blow up the cop and not, get, or not expect to get arrested. But the best thing to do is, for this trustee in question, just to step down for like, maybe even give it a period of six months for the board can, for the CISD to heal from this. And we start 2020 fresh. We don't need all this mess on here and all this bigotry and hatred against the LGBTQ community. That's all I have to say. I uh, hope you have a great Merry Christmas and Happy Holidays. Thank you. Next. Amber Fusca. Your responsibility as school board members is to set the vision and goals for the district. Adopt policies that give the district direction to set priorities and achieve its goals and to focus on student achievement. Implementing policies that will ensure success for all students. When our public school system fails to render help and equal opportunity to special needs students, that is an issue. Being the parent of a special needs child is exhausting. It's difficult enough wondering daily if you're doing right by your child. If you've done the right things, if you've done enough things, if you've just made a decision that could alter your child's life forever, in good or bad ways. The added stress of fighting a district for services your child is legally entitled to is unacceptable. Once is a chance, twice is a coincidence, the third time is a pattern. The state of Texas has a pattern of denying special education that has reached epidemic proportions. And Conroe ISD has had a part in continuing this issue. I am not the first per parent to stand here and bring up this issue, but I will do everything in my power to make sure I am one of the last. The true measure of our society is how we treat those that are most vulnerable. Within the school system, special needs children are among the most vulnerable. You are the heads of Conroe ISD, but you must also be the neck and move, it, move the district in the direction you choose. I am asking you to choose to champion special education and, spe and children with special needs. Make sure Conroe ISD is following their legal obligations of child find and actually identifying children with special needs. Early identification of cognitive or other disorders, especially autism, can be, be a life-changing difference for both the child and the family. Increase the budget for special education and provide the services needed to give special needs children, students, the chance to learn the skills, to work, to live independently, and to be functioning members of our society. As I said last month, your actions, or lack thereof, speak volumes. The message being received is that you care nothing for special education or the children that require it. If that is not your intended message, be the change. Put special education on the agenda so that we can have an open and honest discussion and do something about it. Thank you. Thank you. Jason Rocha. Hello, board. Uh, thank you for having us again, having uh, us every month until there's a public apology or some kind of action uh, from either the board or the district. Um, I'm going to read this same statement over and over uh, right now. Quote, the black community is the most vile, hate-filled communities I've ever come across. The Christian community is one of the most vile, hate-filled communities I've ever come across. Women are the most vile, hate-filled people I've ever come across. 
I, I, I'm very cynical. And part of me thinks if somebody had said that, any one of those statements, the board would have reacted a lot differently. Um, I think you guys did what you could. I think that it's a shame that we have uh, a lot of red tape and your hands are tied. But now is the time to make that change for the future. To, I'm on two boards myself. You can't do anything right away, but I know that you can change the bylaws to eventually restrict things like this from happening again. And I don't care if it's next year or in two years, but the kids of this district have to see this every time they think of Mr. Enman for the next three years. I'm gonna get a little personal. So I skipped out on Thanksgiving um, because my, my, my grandmother said some awful things. She said uh, that uh, gay marriage was like inviting her to uh, go to an abortion. So my mother invites me to Thanksgiving dinner and I said, this was about a week before, uh, a week after the meeting. And I said, well, uh, unfortunately, Mom, there have been a lot of political things going on in Conroe ISD. This is a, a text. I can send it to you guys if you want. Um, so unfortunately, every time I read the statements from Mr. Inman, every time I heard somebody else repeat those statements, I thought of her. I'm a 34-year-old person. Imagine what a teenager felt what a parent of the teenager felt when they heard these statements, when they have to see it in the news time and time again. And what's worse is when they see it in the news that there's not more action. The Facebook, I'm sorry, your website posts, I think it's a great start, I do. Um, I just, I, I, we want more. I don't know how much more you can do, but do it all. Because the one voice that stands out the most is one that on good authority does not represent the majority of this board. So be that voice, be the louder voice together because we know that you can do it. So thank you. Thank you, sir. Wendy Maurer. Maurer. Good evening. I'm the proud parent of a child at Suchma Elementary, and first off, I'd like to say how loving of a campus Suchma is, and thank you for that. Um, as the former special education teacher for over 10 years, I know many of the barriers in public education, but once I became a parent of a child with disabilities, I saw the real challenges of families like ours face. I'm here to talk to you about the vision of having all teachers having special education certification. I want each of you to think of what inclusion looks like. What does it look like to you? What does it look like in the community? As sitting on the board for the Texas Council for Developmental Disabilities Partners in Policy Making, I've learned the long-term outcomes for my child as he gets older, as far as state services, and it's not a very pretty picture. As a parent, I have a fear of knowing that my 90% of individuals with autism are unemployed. That data reflects the early experiences that the life outcomes for my child. My 90% is currently sitting in your general education classroom. If my child had a more inclusive educational experience where all the staff on campus had the certification, training, and ongoing support, would he have the opportunity to break that 90% and have a meaningful purpose within his community? To me, that's inclusion. I want my child to have access to all the amazing teachers and programs within your district, not just the ones with a segregated certification or segregated support. Ask yourself how Connor ISD can be the leadership of school districts within the state of Texas where teachers have no segregated certifications. Think of the amount of children that you'll be able to reach. Together, whether our children have disabilities or not, hand in hand, we can all work together. I know that we are having a lot of children within the general education classroom that are not reaching their full potential because their teachers do not have this training or the staff or the certification. Our administrators do not have the training or support to give effective immediate feedback to their staff for the training and support for our children with disabilities. There's no accountability when it comes to this. We've got to make a change. 
I hope that this board considers your teacher certification requirements, the district goals, and think of the highly qualified teacher reimbursements the district can acquire back from the state. But most of all, think of how Connor ISD can work towards becoming the state model of districts by becoming the first inclusive district in the state of Texas. If all means all, then we must move forward proactively to service all of our students. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Ty. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Ty, and um, I am a uh, sophomore at the Woodlands High School, and uh, I'd like to thank you for uh, letting me speak today and holding this. Um, I'd like to talk on behalf of my fellow students and classmates. Um, more specifically, I'd like to re repeat a quote that was publicly re released from board member Dale Inman that I have found particularly distasteful. Um, it reads that the LGBTQ community is one of the most vile, hate-filled hate -filled communities I've ever come across, and I've spent time in the Middle East with Sorry if I mispronounce this. Hezbollah and radical Muslim uh, and radical Muslims. Uh, these folks are vicious. Sorry if I'm a little nervous. I don't do a lot of public speaking. Um, I'm not a member of the LGBTQ community or of the Muslim community, but I can see the effects that statements like these have on the students of CISD. And school is hard already. I'm a member of the baseball team and an improv troupe, and um, currently studying for finals as we speak or midterms. Excuse me. Um, and uh, if the goal is to minimize stress put on students, uh, it's not very helpful when people that are supposed to represent us are um, not including us and uh, speaking out publicly against us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Nicole May. Hi, I'm here to talk about dyslexia, but I want to start with something kind of fun. We have some. Um, some Christmas cards, and they're written by some really special people. Thank you. Our kids. Thank you. Thank our you. dyslexic Thank kids. You. So Thank you will see in these cards Thank some you, misspelled Thank words, you. You some backwards letters, some physical oh, handwriting. But you'll also find in here some beautiful sentiment and some really creative drawings. I don't know. My son drew a picture that was supposed to look like an anime of. Skeeter Hubert, but it doesn't quite look that way. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we got to see that. He's yeah. like, he's he's that. Like, oh, he's like, that's the worst anime I've ever written in my life. Oh, you got it. But I said, it's good. It's good. See it's fine. Spot on. Oh, yeah, you got it right. <laughs> um, but I, I have the privilege of knowing quite a few of these kids. Um, perhaps one day you guys will get to know them as well. Um, these kids are my heroes. They go to school every day and work hard, and school is not easy for them because. What they do every day is read all day long. And for a dyslexic student, reading and writing is very difficult. So basically for eight hours a day, it's really hard. <laughs> so um, you know, I had a bunch of stuff written. I'm just not going to go with it. I'm just going to basically summarize kind of where we stand with everything. Um, we, we believe we're really under-identifying dyslexics in our district. Um, the the 20% is what they say, experts say, is, is out there for dyslexics. We're identifying 5%. Um, we're also saying that the budget is not enough. It's a $3 million budget, is what I've been told. Um, and if we're only identifying five, and, and I think they're maxed out. I think they're doing everything they can with that $3 million. They're spreading it as far as they can go. Um, but it's not enough. You know, we need to identify more. I mean, I'm willing, I will go away if you guys get to 10%. <laughs> but I, I think, you know, we need to really address, like, how do we come up with $3 million and how do we say that that was enough when we're not hitting the mark on it? And we know that students that do not get remediation and intervention for dyslexia, quality remediation and intervention, do not finish high school. And if they do, they don't go on to accomplish their dreams, and that's really what we're here for. Um, and, and we're asking to really relook at the quality of services that we're offering. We're offering the bare minimum, um, and so we're, we're really hoping to get more from that. So um, I did have the privilege of meeting with Dr. Upshaw, and um, yes, a couple of us did, so we had our first good meeting. Um, it was a tough meeting, right, but it was good. We did it. 
And um, with Dr. Ashad, Dr. Henry, and Tracy Landis, the dyslexia specialist for the district, um, we hope to have a lot more meetings. Um, we definitely hope to have a member of special education present because our student population also falls within special education and we have some pretty big concerns within that as well. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank Appreciate you. Thank you. Merry Christmas. Have a good one. Tasha Smith. Dr. Tasha Dr. Smith. Dr. Tasha Smith. Dr. Tasha Smith. That's what we're doing. That's right. Thank you, thank you. Good evening, President Williams, Board of Trustees, Dr. Noel. Again, I'm Tasha Smith, the proud principal of Conroe High School, and I appreciate the opportunity to be able to speak to you all this evening. As you know, we have many amazing Conroe High School alumni, just like the two we have on our school board, Mr. Scott Kidd and Mr. John Husbands. I'm pushing it. <laughs> <laughs> I am here tonight to publicly show our appreciation for a gift that our campus and community has received. A Conroe High School alumnus who wants to remain anonymous has graciously made a donation of over $7,000 to pay off the lunch debt for our students at Conroe High and Washington Junior High. Drawing from his own experience in Conroe ISD, the donor relayed, there's so much I owe to the teachers, coaches, students, and parents I grew up with in Conroe. It was and continues to be a close, supportive community where you learn to take care of your neighbors. He mentioned that his former coach, Buddy Moorhead, lived by those words every day and taught them well. This donation is just a very small token of thanks and payback during this Christmas season, and I hope there are others that can pay it forward at schools in the city and county. We are grateful for this blessing for our students and their families. This also serves as a great example to all of our students and to us as adults, the importance of giving back. Thank you to our anonymous donor and all that support our Conroe Tigers every day. Thank you and Sikkim Tigers. Thank you. I'd like to, to make a statement on that. Actually, the, uh, the Salam reached out to me uh, last week for this anonymous donation. And um, um, you know, I know his heart and his spirit. And uh, you know, many of us, we drive by the stadium, we see Buddy Moorhead. Uh, I had the pleasure to play for him and know him. And it, you think about a stadium being named after somebody, you think of wins and losses. But it wasn't about that. He loved all students. He loved, you know, no matter the differences, he loved all students. And uh, in that spirit, uh, the, the, the donor wanted to challenge those in the community to, uh, to make a difference. Like he's just trying, like you said, a small token of his appreciation for everything that he experienced uh, growing up here uh, and challenge others to do the same. Uh, fortunately, um, you know, we had that grant for the, uh, uh, to address homelessness. And as of this week, you know, we have 550 students in CISD that are homeless and, uh, you know, over, over this holiday season. And so what has occurred through a, a year of trying to get community involvement, which we have, uh, to help out uh, these students in need, uh, there was a discovery of, a, of an app uh, that we can download, that everybody can download. And so if a child um, may just need a, a pair of shoes or maybe a jacket, a winter jacket, something like that, that the app will allow to, uh, somebody in the community to meet that need uh, um, fairly easily. Uh, so we're encouraging those to, to kind of get involved with that and there'll be more about that. But the reason I brought that up is because uh, this donor is challenging the community because uh, we do have an incredible community uh, uh, of those that that love our students, all students, and uh, just an opportunity to reach out and, and make a difference in, in, in those kids' lives. So again, thank you for everything that you do. And I, I know uh, they'll be very happy and pleased uh, of everything you're doing there, and I'll report back to, to them on that. Thank you. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you. Well done. Outstanding. OK. Thank you, Ms. Scott. Um, item three, consent agenda, gentlemen. I've received no request to uh, remove anything on the consent agenda. With that, I'll entertain a motion. I move approval of the consent agenda as presented. Second. Okay, we have a motion second. All in favor? Motion passes. Thank you, gentlemen. 
Okay, item four, curriculum and instruction. <coughs> Consider approval of targeted improvement plan for San Jacinto and Creighton Elementary Schools. Dr. <coughs> Noel, please. All right. Dr. Phillips, present. Thank you. President Williams, members of the board, Dr. Null. <clears throat> We're here tonight to present the targeted improvement plans for San Jacinto and Creighton Elementary Schools. And I think tonight we have several um, representatives from those campuses, so I just want to acknowledge them first and, and thank them for all their work in this plan. So if you all stand. They've worked very hard on putting this plan together. So starting this year, a campus with an overall grade of D must develop and implement a targeted improvement plan that is approved by the Board of Trustees. The schools must engage in a continuous improvement process to develop the plan, much like the process that Houston Elementary has participated in in the past. However, Creighton and San Jacinto are not identified as schools in IR, but so the plan is presented and approved by you, but it's retained here locally and it's not turned into the state and the state does not oversee it. So here's a look at the accountability results from 2019 for each domain for the two schools. Remember domain one is how many students passed at the approaches level. Domain two is about the progress of individual students and also how the schools compare with other schools like them. Domain three is about closing gaps between various student groups. Here's a look at how the schools did overall in reading, math, and writing. You can see math is a strength for both of our schools and writing is a challenge. So these targeted improvement plans use the same planning process as Houston. They're based on the effective schools framework. The school teams went through a very robust needs assessment to identify their prioritized focused areas. Now these targeted improvement plans are not the only plan that these schools are working under. They also developed a complete improvement plan at the district level that you approved last month. This is just what they need to work on as identified by the effective schools framework. So interestingly enough, um, after going through the needs assessment, both San Jacinto and Creighton ended up with the same two prioritized focused areas, and these also happen to be the same two that um, Houston had as well. And so as a district, we realize that this is probably an area that we could all get better at. And so this year, we have 17 schools that we're pulling together uh, throughout the year to study these two essential actions and to get better at them. So the first one is, uh, objective-driven daily lesson plans with formative assessments. And this is all about how teachers plan together, how they, how they plan their time, how they pace their lessons, how they um, uh, differentiate for students of different levels. And the second uh, prioritized focus area is data-driven instruction. And this is the strengths of teacher teams coming together, analyzing data, identifying areas of focus for students, and then targeting instruction for them. Um, so we want to also let you know that there's some additional support that we're providing our two schools. Um, Sam Jaceno, we've identified a, a temporary part-time campus administrator, a retired principal who's going to come back and help support the campus, freeing up the principal um, to be able to work with teachers more. A positive behavior support liaison, full-time position, is going to be added at San Jacinto. Um, we have a student support coach, a district student support coach, who is going over with more additional time devoted to um, San Jacinto. We have a certified Lone Star governance coach who we have contracted with that's coming in to help. This is the same coach that also worked with Houston Elementary over the past couple of years. Uh, Dr. Tamika Taylor um, is the DCSI. She's out there bi-monthly supporting the school as is her team, her data team is out there working with uh, teachers on uh, the various data and tests that they give. And then finally, Dr. Upshaw and her team with curriculum and instruction, she is sending out um, district coordinators, coaches, and then Dr. Upshaw is also there herself. <clears throat> Creighton, we have similar support. Um, we've give, uh, provided Creighton with additional funds for planning days so that teachers can have uninterrupted time to, to plan. Uh, they also have, will get a full-time positive behavior support liaison. Uh, Dr. Tamika is out there bi-monthly supporting them. They also work with our certified Lone Star governance coach. And then uh, Dr. Taylor's team is out there with the data meetings. And of course, Dr. Upshaw with her team is providing support as well. So unless there are questions, we ask your approval for the targeted improvement plans for Creighton and San Jacinto elementaries. I do have a couple of questions. Mm -hmm. Get the motion first, if you don't mind. So moved. 
We second. have a motion. I have a second. Now discussion. Gentlemen, go ahead, uh, Trustee Mr. Moore. Um, you had mentioned uh, specifically on domain two, mm -hmm. with closing the gap. Domain does, three is closing the gap. Okay. Do, does the transient student population at either one of those campuses have anything to do with that, with being having difficulty tracking incoming students who don't have previous data? They're coming in for the first time to that campus from third or fourth grade and may not have data following them? Um, we do a pretty good job when we get a hold of them assessing where they are. So I can't really say that that is an issue. A lot of the mobility is also from within the district. And so we're able to, to track down things that way too. So I wouldn't say necessarily okay. that that is a, a challenge. Okay. Good question though. And then um, I was making a lot of notes and you were actually answering them. They were oh. going through. So I'm trying <laughs> to go through and one check off. Um, you had mentioned student support coaches. Mm -hmm. um, in, in your opinion, do we have adequate instructional coaches, both staffing and resources on those campus, or do we need to look at that area as well? Both, both of those schools are Title I, so they do have multiple instructional coaches that are designated just for them. In addition, we're also bringing in district coaches. So I, I do feel that the coaching is adequate. The behavior coaches, um, we have just recently increased them to a full, a full position, and that's because we were noticing the behavior concerns were escalating and so I really I, I think they're in pretty good shape with this thank you, thank you. Mm -hmm. okay gentlemen any other questions okay here no further questions we have a motion second all in favor motion passes thank you Ms. thank Dr. you Jones. appreciate you um, all right we're gonna move right along item five administration uh, receive update on attended zones for Dr. and junior high school Dr. No all right Dr. Dr. Hines right, come forward Good evening, President Williams, members of the board, Dr. Noll. Uh, tonight I wanted to uh, come back and give you an update on where we are with the Stockton Junior High Attendance Boundary Committee. Just to kind of refresh a little bit, we are opening a new junior high school in August of 2020, which is Stockton Junior High School. It will serve students in grades in grade 7 and 8. And it's located at 2750 Excellence Avenue, and that's next to Bosman Intermediate School. And just kind of a reminder, uh, this is Stockton on the map, and of course this is where we have the, uh, the solar field. Um, this is Bosman, so you can kind of see an Excellence Avenue cuts between what is the loop back to 3083. Couple of renderings later on this evening. You'll see some live pictures with a construction update. But these are just some of the renderings of the facility. Now, Pete Junior High School, which was uh, which opened in 2013, or actually relocated in 13, has a capacity of 1,450 students. Uh, it currently is at capacity, utilizing two portable classrooms. Washington Junior High, which is uh, a 1951 facility, has a capacity of 700 students, and it has an enrollment of 964 students, utilizing 11 portable classrooms. Uh, for next year, wa the Washington Junior High will be repurposed as Washington High School, which will allow programs at Hawk to relocate uh, to that current site. Uh, after Stockton Junior High School opens, so we, we are uh, actually in a meeting today working on making some plans for that. Stockton Junior High, High School will, uh, with a capacity of 1,450 students, will provide 750 additional junior high seats in the Conroe feeder. So we know this is a, a challenging process. We recognize that schools are communities, that families have a history with their schools. They often purchase their homes to go to a certain school, um, and we understand that. And um, we. We also understand that the 10-year projection for our feeder is that we are going to go up to roughly 3,500 students, um, so which means we'll go over capacity at some point in the future, um, even after we open Stockton um, and repurpose Washington. So what we're trying to accomplish, we had some basic objectives as we set up about this process. Uh, first and foremost, we wanted to develop what would be the attendance boundary for Stockton Junior High School, and if you're familiar, you know, its relationship to Pete, they're both um, on the north side off the loop and so um, they're kind of similar in terms of their uh, which led to kind of an east-west uh, split as we and you'll see some of the maps here momentarily to provide crowding relief at Pete so the other goal was to reduce some enrollment at Pete to leave some room for growth that we know is coming but there's also a growth happening on the east side of our district as well so 
it's, it's, we have to leave some room at Stockton. So we were trying to balance some of those, um, some of those challenges. So we were looking, aiming you know, somewhere in that 300 range to try to buy some time um, with both junior highs. So to just kind of take you through a little bit, this is the current map um, and, and as it exists currently. And so we started from that map. Um, and to do this, we have a committee, and, and I will say we, it has been a wonderful committee with which to work. Uh, they've really done an outstanding job and um, been very thorough, so I enjoyed working. This has been a good group. And this committee's looked at um, and developed over 20 scenarios that we've brought forward and looked at and evaluated. Um, in addition, the committee also looked at zoning that's related to intermediate schools. So as we kind of worked through the process, we also began to look at how that affected intermediate uh, zones. We know that intermediate zones are going to change in the future. Um, the second school in this uh, bond package will be a, a, a K-6 school in the Conroe area. So at some point we'll go back and look at 5th, 6th enrollment. In addition, when we open uh, the replacement junior high for Moorhead, if, and that's repurposed as an intermediate school, we will create some 5th and 6th grade seats on the east side. And so there's certainly some, some opportunities in the future to look at intermediate school. Uh, we, as we went through this process, we had several considerations. We didn't take it lightly. We understand that each student that we look at represents a family. Uh, what we do feel strongly about is after and however this works out, that we will have quality schools at both schools and feel good about what we'll offer. And then our timeline is to have, hopefully for you, in January, a recommendation from the committee. And so, so what I wanted to do is just kind of walk you through a little bit about the three scenarios that are currently up on our website. And they've been up there a few weeks. Um, currently, we have uh, Pete Junior High, as I mentioned, 1,450 students. Just to give you an idea, demographically, it is 52% economically disadvantaged. And Washington Junior High at 964 students is 81% economically disadvantaged. In scenario A, which I'm going to pull up here in a second, um, Pete would come in under, and these are geocoded numbers, so we use geocoded that is who lives in the boundaries, not necessarily who goes to school there. There could be differences based on special programs or parents who teach there and bring their children. So this is who lives in the boundaries. Uh, but Pete would uh, come down to 1184, and Stockton uh, would be at 1236. And you can see under scenario A, it's a roughly a 10% um, difference in the socioeconomics. That impacts 655 students. An impact. Mm -hmm. We measured who ended up at a different school, but really everybody at Washington will be at a different school. So it was who at Washington would be at Pete and who at Pete would be at Stockton is how we calculated that, just to give you an idea. And um, as we looked at it, um, we there are some impacted areas. And so all of the Washington area would go to Stockton except for the areas that really were in central Conroe. We had some areas that included um, some of the neighborhoods and apartment complex, uh, Tall Timbers and the Conroe Apartments, MLK Park, and South First and Foster Oaks and Pecan Grove. So those areas um, that were currently at Washington would be at Pete. And areas rezoned from Pete to Stockton included the, those north zones along the loop, which is Wiggins Village and um, Moss Hill, Northwood Acres, Sunset Ridge, Woodside Manor. Um, and then there's those east zones that when you saw the map that kind of jump out at you that cross over, uh, and I won't name off all of those. And then there's those south zones, and those zones um, <coughs> certainly run along the freeway. Um, that's River Plantation and Stewart's Forest and Crichton Ridge, and so that includes those areas um, back out. So on this map under Scenario A, all the light red areas represent what is uh, currently at Pete that would be at Stockton, and then the lighter blue represents something that uh, the areas that are currently zoned at Washington that would be at Pete, um, and the dark blue would be currently uh, Pete, and the dark red would be uh, currently at Washington. So that just gives you kind of an idea of the changes under Scenario A. Scenario B um, had Pete at 1177, Stockton at 1243. This one added at 62.5% to 75%. The impact um, was less, went down to 492. And so this was, uh, and certainly scenario B is the, uh, 
very much the popular with the committee, um, very popular with the committee in terms of what we looked at. And they are the, the bigger maps are over on the side, certainly that a little easier to see some of the streets. Uh, this is very much based off of very similar to A in the, in the, the I'm going to go back to, uh, let me just go up to B. Um, the dividing line really kind of runs along. We, the committee tried different lines. We looked at 75, we looked at 45, and, you know, it just didn't get us the right number, so we kept kind of moving the line further uh, east to, to kind of get the numbers. So really this ends up along 1st Street and Pacific Street for the most part, and, and, and then the railroad tracks, and then it just kind of juts in in town in the central part. Um, so this is scenario B. It's a little very similar. One of the areas I'll point out is um, this area that is just east of 75 that, um, and this was an area of a lot of discussion for us because it is an area that currently goes to Cryer, uh, as does uh, the other area that is light red next to it. And so uh, this map, that group stayed at Pete, so it reduced, that's really where the number came for reducing um, the number of crossover. Um, so we really looked at that. The scenario C, very similar to scenario B numbers. It's a little different configuration. Again, mostly in the central part of, of Conroe. Um, it, it does start with A, but it, it didn't have sections 38A and 40B, which are in the central zone. It excluded some areas such as uh, Tall Timbers and Foster Oak and Woods Way. Um, the areas uh, that go from Pete to Stockton are the same under B as C. So most of that was just a change and again in town, but the same impact number. And so I will tell you from the committee standpoint, um, it, it was more attracted, it has been more attracted to the lower impact trying to achieve our goals. But we felt like all three of these fit within the parameters, but certainly. Can you um, show us the third map? Oh, I'm sorry. There it is. It's just the third map. It's just subtle. And that doesn't make as much sense as the other one. It's yeah. B to me. Yeah. And B is the, and I will tell you from the committee feedback, B is the, by far and away, the popular. But I know it takes a lot of options so uh, you know yes, yes sir what how many kids are in what neighborhood and yes sir exactly and, th and every time we run those scenarios where we calculate so I want to just briefly touch on intermediate we currently look we looked at the intermediate maps as well we know that there are some changes coming um, there was a lot of, of discussion and feedback this currently represents the red areas our Stewart area which is rapidly growing the green represents Cryer um, the yellow represents Travis and the blue Bosman and what I will tell you is under all of our scenarios, Travis becomes a split intermediate school. Um, and what we worked to was try to say, okay, can Bosman stay 100% and Cryer stay 100%? We know Travis is going to be split. All three of the options have a fairly even split at Travis, so the cohort size is meaningful, meaning that if you, when you go to a new school, you're not going alone. There should be a good number of students that go with you. And so we wanted to look at that. Uh, but again, the location in the central part of our district um, and we also want to be mindful of not taking too many um, back and moving around, knowing that in the future, a few years, we'll have to rezone again in some intermediates. We want to be careful of that. So we ran two scenarios. Both of them have minor impact. One had an 80 impact. The other one is like in the 30s. Uh, under this impact, uh, for this map, probably easier to show you, it's kind of a clockwise rotation. Um, so the light blue would be moving from Cryer over to Bosman. Uh, this light yellow would be moving from Bosman over to Travis, and then this light green area along uh, 75 would be moving from Travis to Cryer. And the committee looked at that. Um, actually, <coughs> scenario two is a lot more popular with our committee. Uh, and this one is an impact of 32, and it really just moves one section, which is that Robin Wood section along the north loop from prior to Bosman. So that neighborhood would be at Bosman for intermediate and then stay at Stockton for the junior high. And, 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 that, and, anyway. and because they're right next door, it just mm -hmm. we were trying to accomplish yeah, that. Right there. Um, so scenario two is the, uh, certainly at this point, the committee's favorite. I can just give you that feedback when, um, in terms of how they're going. We've had some comments. We've uh, sent home one update. We'll send another one home to you probably next week. And um, just so you can kind of see the comments that have been coming in. Generally, 
you know, I would share, and, and the feedback has been people don't want to change, um, and we kind of expected that. Um, and so there hasn't really been any surprises. Um, but, uh, you know, I think in terms of, I know we've had some people, uh, someone from our committee lives in this neighborhood, and they were certainly felt better about, hey, if we're going to move, moving intermediate would help us. And so um, we did get that feedback. So that's really kind of the update. We do have it all on our web page under the ABC committee site. We also have the current maps. <clears throat> and they've been up there a few weeks. We've been through two phases of the process. The first phase was kind of the overview in October and then November. Um, we were out sharing our three options. And um, we'll be back uh, in January to let the public know what the committee is going to recommend, and then we want to bring to you our final recommendation at the January school board meeting. Thank you, Dr. Hines. Gentlemen, any questions? All right, keep moving. All right, item 5B consider and approve selection of construction manager at risk for York Junior High School. Dr. No? All right, Foster. <laughs> Well, good evening, President Williams, members of the board, Dr. Null. It's my pleasure to bring forward for your consideration and approval uh, the selection of a construction manager risk for New York Junior High School logistics, which is a project resulting from our uh, recent bond election. So <clears throat> our design architect, PBK, helped us prepare uh, a RFQ, Request for Qualifications, and we, the district, published it. Uh, we advertised it uh, as required by law, and we've had 10 companies respond to our request for qualifications. Now, the law also limits us to no more than five to participate in the second step of our two-step selection process. Uh, our committee read each of the 10 responses, uh, graded them carefully, and we shortlisted uh, five contractors, Duratech, Inc., GTT Contractors, George General Contractors, Marshall Construction, and Weber Commercial Construction, to participate in the second step of our two-step construction or two-step selection process our committee has uh re is recommending that marshall construction company uh, be selected as the offeror that presents the best value for the district based on our criteria i also like to let you know that we're uh we're showing you the total rankings of all the all the uh, shortlisted of all five uh just in case we need to move to the second ranked and the negotiation process but we feel marshall is the best value and we are asking for your approval at this time Second. Any discussion? Yeah. Who built for York originally? Mr. Husbands. Marshall did. Let's give a second. Okay, we have a motion second. No more discussion. <laughs> well, any more discussion? All right, all in favor? Our right, motion passes. Thank you. Mr. Foster, let's go to item C, please. 5C, consider approval selection of construction manager at risk for Washington project, maintenance project, and hog project. Uh, so just like uh, the previous item, we're asking for your consideration and approval of the selection of a construction manager at risk for our, our Washington maintenance and Hawk project, again, resulting from our 2019 bond recently. Uh, at this time, our design architect, uh, the IBI group, helped us prepare, and we published the RFQ. We had five companies respond to the request for qualifications. Uh, all five of them were subsequently invited to participate in step two. Uh, they were Angelo Bryant, GTT, Joris Construction, Sadako Construction and Teal Construction. Our committee read them all, graded them carefully, uh, and after uh, receiving the pricing uh, in step two, our committee feels that GTT Construction is selected to be the offeror submitted the best value for the district for this project. And likewise, we're also publishing all of the rankings as part of the board item, uh, so we can see that if we need to move to the second offeror, we can. At this time, we're requesting your approval of GTT as our construction manager at risk. I'll make a motion to second. approve. Motion and second. Any okay. discussion, gentlemen? I'm going to stand vote. All right. Oh, well, it's an abstention. All right, so um, all in favor? Abstain? Abstentions? One. That's it. Motion passes. Thank you. Um, item 5D, approval. Consider approval, selection of geotech, surveying, to test and uh, balance service providers and authorize the superintendent to negotiate and execute contracts for those services. Dr. Noll. Yeah, At this time, we bring forward for your consideration and approval a selection of multiple vendors for multiple uh, uh, types of work. 
Uh, each of these types of work is required by law for the work that we do, the construction and capital improvement processes we do. Geotechnical engineers are used to study the ground and help us design our foundations over on the dirt by which we build our buildings on. Uh, surveyors are required to locate them appropriately and, and help us with uh, land acquisition, things of that nature. And our test and balance companies help us make sure the air conditioning is functioning correctly at the end of a, in a construction project. So we had uh, published a uh, request for qualifications for these. They're all professional services in, in the engineering uh, fields. Uh, so we're creating a pool based on our overall projected project volume, again, resulting mostly from our uh, bond election most recently. So our, our pool of a recommended pool of geotechnical providers is Terracon Consultants, HCS Consultants, Professional Service Industries, Geoscience Engineering, Alpha Testing, and Nino and more. Our surveying respondents uh, that we're recommending as the pool is Jones and Carter, Land Tech, and Jeffrey Moon and Associates. And for test and balance, it's engineered air balance, TAB Technologies, Mesa Commissioning, National Precision Air, and Campus Engineering. This time we're requesting your approval of these in the pools and each discipline will be negotiated individually for each project. It's not a guarantee of work, but it gives us a selection uh, to deal with as we deal with our volume moving forward. This okay. time we request your approval. We have a request and a motion. Motion, Mr. Sandy. All right, second, Mr. Kidd. Questions? Yes, sir. Questions. All right, Mr. 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 Hubert. Just real quick, they, a part of part of putting this in and getting the bids and all, whenever we're, you're coming to us with an overall cost of a project, this type of service is included in that overall cost of the project, right? Absolutely. The, uh, the, the like, take the bond example as, as an example. Our projects that we advertise for the bond, the numbers that the public see include these as part of that process. So it's not just construction, not construction and design. It is an all-encompassing number. We advertise it, handles everything we need to bring that project to completion. Great. Thank you. I just have one question. How, how many of these are have local offices here in Conroe? Uh, of all three disciplines, you, I mean, just mm -hmm. you know, of the 15, there's one or whatever, and then um, also, um, were there any locals that were overlooked? So overlooked the, or out out scored, as it may be, whichever. Right. I'm, I'm, there were some in the surveying category where locals that were out scored, uh, but we, I mean, surveying is not as a voluminous discipline as for us. Geotech, uh, four of the the selected are have offices here in Conroe, two of them are in Houston. And then uh, from our test and balancing companies, none of them are actually in Conroe, so they're all uh, coming yeah. out of the Houston market for us. Thank you. Okay, we have a motion, second. Uh, any discussion is over. All right, all in favor? Great, motion passes. All right, item 5E, receive capital improvement update. Mr. Falcon. All right, well, at this time, I'd like to bring uh, up to date for the capital improvements we have underway throughout the district. Starting with uh, Stockton Junior High. So Stockton is scheduled to open in August of 2020. So it's roughly about 75% complete at this point. We've been talking about getting the building envelope closed in. As you can see from this angle, we are nearing that. So we're roughly speaking about a month from being in a dry state for the entirety of the building. So I reported last month that we're continuing to produce uh, solar power. Uh, we are working our way around the building with masonry and glass, things of that nature closing up now. If you're looking at a, an actual picture of the uh, front entry of Stockton. And then on the inside, it's starting to become uh, a school. So where it is dry, we are able to hang drywall to our tape, float, and finish. And we're starting the process of painting uh, throughout. So you're looking at the basically the block filler, the prime coat for the CMU block down the, uh, I believe that's the fine arts corridor uh, for that building now. So like I said, it is scheduled to open in August of 2020, and we perceive it to be on schedule at this time. Mr. Foster. Yes, sir. Have you informed uh, Dr. Stockton that he's only going to have one trophy case to utilize to decorate that? We gave him one, but we, we had to enlarge it to about 40 feet long. <laughs> 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 yeah, indeed. <laughs> well, moving forward, uh, Conroe High School, the additions and renovations project, which is this is uh, probably the last time we're actually going to talk about it, is, is, is completing. Well, we, we term as phase one, which is all the work from the 2015 bond referendum. So you're looking at a shot down the corridor, one of the new collaboration areas on the ground floor. You can see that the, we've been able to increase the space in the corridors on the oldest portions of the building a, a substantial amount to make it more uh, user friendly for the students and staff in that building. Uh, we've started loading the classrooms up with furniture. So over the holiday break, uh, we're loading it up with technology. So it'll be ready to come back uh, ready for school when the students return in January. 
And that is our update. Awesome. Thanks. All right, item six. Business finance, consider approval of purchasing buses using RFQ, RFP 1905 Mr. Reeves. Good evening, President Williams, members of the board, Dr. Knoll. Tonight we're requesting the Board of Trustees approve the purchase of additional buses through RFP 1905-04 for school buses for an estimated expenditure of approximately $3.5 million. In September, the Board of Trustees awarded RFP number 1905-04 for school buses for an estimated $1.65 million. Uh, the prices are firm through August of 2020. With the passage of the 2019 bond referendum in November and the availability of additional grant funding, the district will have the ability to purchase additional buses. These buses will be used for replacing buses that have met their life expectancy and for student growth. Included in this request is 25 regular education buses, four mid-sized special education buses, and two multi-purpose vehicles, all equipped with air conditioning and seat belts. By approving this item, the district will add approximately 46 new buses to the fleet, including the original purchase from September, and exchange 23 older <coughs> non-air conditioned diesel buses through the TCEQ grant for a net of 23 new buses. Funds for this purchase are provided for in the Capital Maintenance Fund, TCEQ grant, and the 20, 2019 Capital Projects Funds. At this time, I request your approval. So moved. A second. A motion and second discussion. Mr. Yeah. Huber. Quick question, just because we're talking about the buses, and when you said that they have seat belts, I've never asked this question, but there's three to a, to a seat, so each kid has their own seat belt. It's not one that goes all the way across like at the roller coaster or something, right? I've never seen yeah, one, so I gotta ask. Time together, man. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's silly, yeah, but are. I've never, I've never, I've, I've wanted to go by and just walk on all these buses no, and see I'm what they look like. Ones. It comes yeah. across this way. It's not just a lap. It's a belt. Yeah. Okay. Shoulder belt. Y'all are all wondering. Y'all just <laughs> <laughs> like a roller coaster. <laughs> like a roller coaster. <laughs> you know, pull it down. Maybe we'll bring a bus next month. I'll show and tell. Do you with it? We'll say Sam, Sam would know. Yes. There are three individual seat belts per seat, and it's uh, three-point height seat belts, so it's not just a lap belt. So it's a, yeah. a shoulder. Shoulder hard. He was expecting that. We knew what you knew what you were doing. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody knew it all. We, we knew. <laughs> okay. All right. The T T Q uh, retirement of buses where you you know chop the engine in half or whatever you have to do to get the grant money. I I've, I've been told that there's like kind of money for the propane buses maybe out of the Volkswagen deal or something like that grants are we applying for those or that is that for the fueling stations for the propane buses what's it for um, or, or, the Volkswagen grant that, uh, that we applied for um, that is for um, propane buses so we are getting propane and diesel buses there's a couple different grants that we're working on uh, for those so this purchase that we did Purchase, um, it was uh, 20 buses, which was the initial one, and these are the second. Five of those we did that. I'm all over the place. I'm excited about these buses. <laughs> 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 Sam, all excited. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 But yeah. All, all I want to know is, is are you getting the propane grants, or, or can you get the buses and then apply for the grants, or is it going on simultaneous? Is that okay and all that? We are we're doing it right. That's all. It's all I, I don't I don't need to tell you how to do it. I, yeah. do it. <laughs> so thank you, Mr. Reeves. I have one more question. Do we need uh, one other question? Excuse me. Sorry, go ahead. Finish. I just wanted to know how many unseat belted and unair conditioned buses do we have left in our fleet <laughs> that we need to replace? Um, we were at about 130, I think it was. Okay. So with this purchase here, we're really uh, putting the big dent. Okay, buses. so we're going to still have about a hundred. Yeah, that's. Uh, well, after this, with the forty-six, we'll be on air conditioning. That's not the seatbelt. Okay. We, we, we well, I'm more. In, I, I mean, both are very important. Yeah. With, with living in Houston or in this part of the country, AC is important. Yeah. Well, we had about five hundred eighty-five buses uh, recently when the board uh, started buying right. buses last year, two thousand eighteen. Right. So it's going to take us a while to get a seatbelt fleet. Right. But the AC buses, we had about 130 uh, that we were trying to uh, get out of the fleet. Okay, okay. Very and good. Those are 2,000 models. Yes. 
And one last question on the propane buses. We only have one fueling station for propane. Is that correct? Yes. Sir. So, are we doing anything about that? Or are we putting all the propane buses where the fueling station is? Right now, they are up in Conroe, uh, but we are looking at another uh, fueling grant. Yeah, because there is some grants out there for that, too. Right. And we still have to have a discussion on where that could possibly go and the size of it and all those kind of things. But there's some grant funds for it. <clears throat> since the buses are ten, twelve thousand dollars $12,000 higher, whatever they are, for the propane, What's the payback in fuel savings? Not even taking into account whether they're more green or whatever, but what's the what's the money say on the break even? I, I haven't done the numbers in a while, um, but to give you an idea, because propane has actually got more efficient the engines. Uh, you were getting about three to four miles per gallon on them, and they're up to about five now. But diesel's also caught up a little bit better as well. We were getting, uh, I think we're getting close to eight or nine miles per gallon for diesel. Where we Seven. So um, propane fuel is cheaper though, far cheaper than diesel. So you are gaining ground every time you pump a gallon of propane fuel, even though it's less efficient, it's still less it's cheaper. So 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 we don't put you on the spot. Can you get back to us on that on that break even point? What you know if, if you if the same bus is traveling the same amount of miles, where's the where's the break even on the twelve thousand dollars expenditure? Thanks. Also probably the maintenance costs and the life expected lifespan yeah. of the, and comparing the two as well. And of course the fuel and station expense. All right, we have a motion second. I had a discussion. All in favor? All right. Motion passes. All right, item six B. Receive financial reports. All right, Ms. Karen Garza. <laughs> President Williams, members of the board, and Dr. Knoll, it is my pleasure this evening to present the financial statements as of November 30th, 2019. The first statement we'll look at this evening is the balance sheet for the general fund, the debt service fund, child nutrition, and self-funded insurance. The balance sheet shows the district's assets, liabilities, and fund balance. If we take a closer look at um, cash and invest investments, we'll focus on the general fund, cash on hand of $14,100, Bank deposits of 416,000. Investments in the state pool of 53.6 million. Our investments with Wood Forest National Bank of 75.8 million. And our longer term investments with TCG Investment Advisors of 51.6 million. For total cash and investments in the general fund of $181.5 million. The next statement we'll look at is the income statement. The income statement shows the revenues and expenditures of the district. Our revenues come from three major sources, local and intermediate, state program, and federal program revenues. Taking a look at local and intermediate sources, our largest generator of revenue in the general fund and debt service fund is our property tax collections, in the food service fund, food sales, and in self-funded insurance premium contributions. Um, expenditures, $103.6 million in the general fund. We'll look at expenditures by major object. Of course, in the general fund, you'll see that our largest expenditure is payroll. In child nutrition, supplies and materials, and in self-funded insurance, claims processing. You will see debt service. We'll have some major expenditures in February, of course, when we make our first debt payment, and in January when we um, sell our first um, block of bonds. Self-funded insurance, um, year-to-date revenue. 12.2 million, year-to-date expense of 11.1 million, for a net revenue over expense of 1.1 million. Our participation at the wellness centers continues to be strong, averaging 582 year-to-date. Our investments as of November 30th, par value of $303.4 million. The pools are yielding 1.923. Our investments with Wood Forest National Bank are yielding 1.89. Our longer-term investments with TCG Investment Advisors yielding 2.05 with a weighted average maturity of 451 days. And our combined portfolio yielding 1.913 with a WAM of 71 days. And our benchmark, the 90-day T-bill, is yielding 1.563. Ms. Garza, I have one question. If you go back just to one slide, the TCG uh, yield, is that is that improving from what I've seen in the last couple of months? Yes, sir. That's what yes, I was sir. thinking because they're finally 
able to redirect some of those. Correct. Okay. All right. Thank you. I'd like any other question? Uh, just make a, a quick comment on the whole thing. Right. Uh, not a question, but a, a statement of appreciation to the entire financial department and purchasing and every department that has a role in the overall health, um, financial health of the department. Of the, the district, I was at a TASB uh, board meeting last week, and they were sharing with us the year and statistics for by board. And uh, Conroe ISD is receiving a check for over a hundred thousand dollars in rebate. Excuse me, from by board, uh, we were the second highest district receiving a, a rebate. Only Houston ISD uh, received a larger rebate than we did on on uh, by board purchases. Um, they're three and a half times our student population, and the rebate was less than double ours. Um, so thank you to everybody that's involved in that purchasing chain um, because you, not only are you leveraging that cooperative buying power to get us the best deals on the day-to-day -day stuff we buy, but we're also receiving a financial rebate of over $100,000 at the end of the year. So awesome. thank you to everybody that's involved in that overall financial picture. Good job, everyone. Yeah, thank, yeah. You. <clears throat> thank you. All right, um, executive session, Dr. No. Thank you. This meeting of the Conroe ISD Board of Trustees is convened on December 17th, 2019. A quorum of the board is present, including the following members. Mr. Moore, Mr. Husbands, Mr. Kidd, Mr. Williams, Mr. Hubert, Mr. Sanders, and Mr. Inman. The board will hear the complaint appeal of parent Kimberly A. in accordance with local board policy FNG. This hearing is being recorded. Ms. A's complaint is against various staff members at College Park High School because the complaint is against district employees and because personally identifiable information about public school students, including the discipline of public school students, could be revealed, the hearing will be held in closed session pursuant to Texas Government Code Section 551.074, 551.082, and 551.0821. The board will also go into executive session under Texas Government Code Section 551.071 for consultation with the board's attorney. The meeting is now adjourned to executive session under Texas Government Code Section 551.071, 551.074, 551.082, and 551.0821. Everyone not associated with this hearing should leave the room. The board will take no action in executive session. The time is now 718. The board has reconvened in open session. The time is now 751. The board will now make its decision. The board can uphold the decisions of the level one and level two hearing officers. The board can overturn the hearing officers decisions or the board can grant any relief they feel is appropriate. Is there a motion? Mr. President, I move that we uphold the decisions of the level one and level two hearing officers and we deny any requested relief. Gentlemen, we have a motion. Can I have a second? I second the motion. Have a second. All, all those in favor? Oh, you got it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Ms. Adkins, the district will send you written notice confirming the action taken by the board. Okay. And thus will conclude the hearing. Thank you all. Do I go back in session? I'm sorry? Do I go back in and yes. take out? <laughs> you'll, you'll, it's back to you, yeah, sir. So we get, we're in session. You got to go in so we can come out. Correct. Okay. Hey, not so we can come in. We're in session. We are in yeah, session. We're in session. We're all right. But now you need, to take back to, no, you need to take us back to executive session now. Yeah, we got some other things here. Okay. Over. Well, you guys got to get me right here. <laughs> all right, item. Eight. She's waiting to see if she can leave. Oh, yes, ma'am. Yes. We're good. Yes, ma'am. Yes, absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Thank, thank, thank we'll get our act together at some point. Yes, thank you. In session, out of session. Thank you, all. Session. Yes. Where we at? You, and you need to you need to put, take us to executive session. All right, executive session. Out of executive Into. Item. You're out right now. Nice. A closed, a closed session of the board will now be held on matters contained in notice for this meeting as authorized by section 551.071, 551.072, 551.0, 851.0821 and 551.074 of Texas Open Meetings Act. Should the board determine that a final action, final decision, or final vote be required with regard to any matter considered in such closed session or executive meeting or session, then such final action, final decision, or final vote shall be held at either A, the public meeting upon reconvening of the public meeting, or B, at a subsequent meeting of the board upon notice thereof as determined as the board shall determine. A closed session of the board will now be held. The time now, the time now is 5, 7, 7.54 p.m. All right, we're now uh, back in session. The time is 8.35.
Um, let's go item. Where are we? Yeah. Nine, nine, eight. Nine, eight. Receive nine, eight. information on local policy manual update one one four. Miss Gladys. Yes, I know you all received that, and I know you were probably busy setting a thousand plus pages that, and you will continue to do uh, so until know. January when we ask you to adopt the local policies that are explained in your item. And if you have any questions, please feel free to contact me, and I will help you with the local policies. We'll do that in January. Well, only one question I had. Sorry to keep everybody, but uh, regarding school safety, yes. they're still coming out with some yes. policies, so there will be some additional oh. updates. Of course, yes. Yeah. So this one was primarily legal, which won't require adoption, and that's the vast majority of the thousand. That's what I thought when I read. Now, yeah. yes, whether they're in our manual right. or not. Right. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Do we have any idea when those? It takes a little, you think this one was from July until, you know, now for them to get this first one out. Okay. So I would say it's so it probably might be five or six more months year. before we get okay. yes. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. Cool. That's it. I move we adjourn. Hold up. Before I do adjourn, I do want to acknowledge and thank Ms. Godfrey for all that she's done this year. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. All your efforts do not go unnoticed. You're our true unsung hero. We really appreciate everything you do for us. Um, how you take care of us on a, on a month in, month out basis. So thank you. Very responsive when I do ask pretty annoying questions at times. So I appreciate that too. Thank you for keeping our president in line. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. We appreciate it. He's done a great job too. All right. Thank, thank you, sir. All right, gentlemen, with that being said, we're adjourned 837.